Hi, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I am an Episcopal priest here in Austin, Texas, and I have had the gift of recovery for many, many years. And I'm doing these podcasts to, in in one sense, pass on some of the stuff that I have learned uh, before I go to that great meeting in the sky. I hope you will have uh, visited by now our two-way prayer website. That's the thing I'm really most interested in is this uh, phenomenon of two-way prayer that they were doing in early AA. And somehow along the way, it, it got itself lost and has had a tremendous impact on my life. And I hope to uh, get that out to the world. So uh, that's the reason behind these podcasts. And if you find them helpful, uh, please share them with someone. We, we want to get this information out because we do think it is important. And if you have any comments, uh, I'd love to hear from you. You can drop me a line at twowayprayer at gmail.com. <clears throat> so this is the second episode of a series we are doing on uh, the impact of Dr. C.J. Jung uh, and his influence on Alcoholics Anonymous. Jung, of course, was a Swiss psychiatrist uh, who played a critical role in the beginnings of AA. And the, the reason for this series is that I think Jung has a great deal to offer us today. It's, it's not just the historical uh, piece that's important. It's also the, the, I think, the map that he wrote or, or designed or discovered, uh, the map to the soul that is, is so, so helpful. We're in search of a spiritual experience, and I think Jung can give us some tremendous insights and some guidance on how to go about finding that. <clears throat> in our first episode in this series, we, we looked at uh, Jung's connection with Roland Hazard uh, back in the 1930s. And this all stemmed from uh, a series of letters that went on between Bill Wilson, the co-founder of AA, and uh, and Dr. Jung. He, he he wrote to him in uh, the early 1960s and was thanking him for uh, for his his influence on AA, the effect that he had on Roland. And um, in the second episode, <clears throat> we're going to explore Jung's response to Wilson's first letter. And it's dated uh, January, the end of January, 1961. And, and Jung died uh, about six months after that, five months or so after that. Um, so he was not well. And yet when he received Wilson's letter, uh, he thought it important enough to respond to it. And he did so rather quickly within a week or so of receiving Wilson's letter. So I thought the best way, it's, it's not a very long letter, I thought the best way to approach this might be to read through uh, Jung's letter to Wilson and then go back and try to unpack some of the, the key elements uh, that, that he, he uh, talks about in, in his letter. So, so let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Stated January 30, uh, 1961. Dear Mr. W, your letter has been very welcome indeed. I had no news from Roland H. anymore and often wondered what has been his fate. Our conversation, which he has adequately reported to you, had an aspect of which he did not know. The reason that I could not tell him everything was that those days I had to be exceedingly careful of what I said. I had found out that I was misunderstood in every possible way. Thus, I was very careful when I talked to Roland H. But what I really thought about was the result of many experiences with men of his kind. <clears throat> his craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness expressed in medieval language, the union with God. How could one formulate such an insight in a language that is not misunderstood in our days? The only right and legitimate way to such an experience is that it happens to you in reality 
It can only happen to you when you walk on a path which leads you to a higher understanding. You might be led to that goal by an act of grace, or through a personal and honest contact with friends, or through a higher education of the mind beyond the confines of mere rationalism. I see from your letter that Roland H. has chosen the second way, which was, under the circumstances, obviously the best one. I am strongly convinced that the evil principle prevailing in this world leads the unrecognized spiritual need into perdition if it is not counteracted either by real religious insight or by the protective wall of human community. An ordinary man, not protected by an action from above and isolated in society, cannot resist the power of evil, which is called very aptly the devil. <clears throat> but the use of such words arouses so many mistakes that one can only keep aloof from them as much as possible. These are the reasons why I could not give a full and sufficient explanation to Roland H. But I am risking it with you because I conclude from your very decent and honest letter that you have acquired a point of view above the misleading platitudes one usually hears about alcoholism. You see, alcohol in Latin is spiritus, and you use the same word for the highest religious experiences as well as for the most depraving poison. The helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. Thanking you again for your kind letter, I remain yours sincerely, C.G. Jung. <clears throat> and then there's a note on the bottom where he writes, quoting Psalm 42, verse 1, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. So there's there's the the letter you can you can find it on the internet. Uh, just put put in uh, Jung Wilson letters and uh, the series of letters will come up. I think this is tremendously important uh, because it it kind of sets the stage for uh, what it was that Roland was seeking that that uh, Jung had sent him on a search. Uh, he was incapable of of curing him, unquote, quote unquote, uh, in the traditional sense that that he needed a spiritual experience. He needed a connection with uh, that power beyond himself, and that was the journey that um, he was sent on by the the great therapist. So uh, let, let's start to unpack this and see if we can. Uh, learn some things that uh, will be helpful to us uh, in our own spiritual journeys. You know, uh, um, Dr. Bob made, made, the, made the statement to uh, Bill Wilson, you know, let's not mess this thing up with a lot of Freudian psychology stuff. Uh, keep it simple. And um, I, I, I like to honor that. Uh, I, I do want to keep it simple. But I, th I think may maybe Bob would allow us to, uh, uh, to go a little further with Jung because he is taking a spiritual path. It's not so much your psychiatric kind of path that, psych that alcoholism is a pathology. Uh, it's, it's a pathology that, that all human beings share in, in Jung's thought. And that is the separation we have from God. And that we as addicts need to find that connection. We need to find it um, more quickly uh, and more desperately than normal people. Uh, but everybody's going to pay a price if, uh, if we don't find that. <clears throat> so let's start uh, going through the letter and, and see what we can, we can learn. Uh, I'll start down a little bit. He says, the reason that I could not tell him everything, tell Roland in those days, was that I had to be exceedingly careful of what I said. I had found out that I was misunderstood in every possible way. Um, 
Jung was a scientist. Uh, he was a believer, but he was also a scientist, and he wrote as a scientist. His belief was that if, if you wanted to be cured, um, it was indeed a spiritual connection that was going to do it. And there were many roads to that, finding that spiritual connection. He was particularly interested in, in helping people uh, who, who couldn't find the way in traditional religious paths. Came across a couple of interesting quotes I, th I thought you might enjoy. Now, this was written later after uh, the 1930s, but, but he, Jung, Jung had experience with Oxford group people uh, in the later 30s. And he wrote this. He said, when a member of the Oxford group comes to me in order to get treatment, I say, quote, you are in the Oxford group. As long as you are there, you settle your affairs with the Oxford group. I can't do it better than Jesus. <laughs> what he's saying there, perhaps a little bit sarcastically, is look, look, the, if, if you want to recover from addiction, it's going to take a spiritual connection. There are many roads to that spiritual connection. If you are, if you are in the Oxford group and that is your path, you stay with that path but you go deeply into that path. I can't do it better than that path will, will lead you. He writes later, as long as a fellow believes in the Oxford group movement, he stays there. And as long as a man is in the Catholic church, he is in the Catholic church for better or worse, and he should be cured by those means. And mind you, I have seen that they can be cured by those means. That is a fact. Absolution, the Holy Communion can cure them, even in very serious cases. You know, Bill Wilson was careful to say, you know, uh, there, there are many roads that lead to recovery. AA is, is just one of them. And I think we, we really need to be mindful of that, that, uh, that we have no monopoly on recovery. But we, we do uh, have an understanding of the path, uh, understanding some things that are necessary for recovery. And, and, and AA provides those. It should be providing those uh, in a way that is, is faithful to Jung in, in terms of finding that spiritual connection. So again, Jung, Jung was very cautious. Uh, so that was the reason he couldn't tell uh, Roland exactly what was going on. But he does, <clears throat> in his letter to Wilson, really get down to the nitty-gritty of it. He says this, His craving, Roland's craving for alcohol, was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness expressed in medieval language, the union with God, that at the core of addiction, there is, there is isolation, estrangement, uh, disconnectedness from life. And, and, and the only way you're really going to find full recovery is to, is to reestablish that connection and satisfy that craving. See, one of the things I do like about Jung is, is he understood the power of alcohol. He, he had an experience himself that, that, that uh, is kind of funny, but it really helps me uh, in, in my uh, putting my trust in him that, that he's, he's someone who knows what he's talking about. And he said that at, at the age of 14, he visited a distillery, uh, and, and that was where he got drunk. He describes the effect as being, quote, gloriously, triumphantly drunk. And he goes on and says, there was no longer any inside or outside, no longer an I and the others. That sense of separation, 
Just, you know, some of us uh, are more prone, I think, to addiction than, than other people. And it's that sense of separation. It's that sense of aloneness, of isolation, and the discovery of alcohol. I mean, you listen to people when they talk about having discovered their first drink, their first drunk, rather. What was that like? I know I puked my guts out, but I'm telling you, I discovered a place inside that I was, you know, kind of said to myself, hey, self, <laughs> where the hell has this been hiding all, all your life? You know, and I'm... Uh, I'm 12 years old, and, and, and I found relief from what I was experiencing as the human condition. Jung described that split within himself as number one and number two. It's, it's like there are two different personalities. And, and now, with, with, with uh, getting drunk, it was a coming together of those two. He goes on, caution and timidity were gone. And the earth and sky, the universe, and everything in it that creeps and flies, revolves, rises, or falls, had all become one. Whoo! <laughs> it had all become one. Uh, that is a similar thing when, you know, I did some acid in, in, in the 60s as well. It, it, it was that spiritual experience. Uh, you know, Jung wrote about that. He said, you, you know, you can't, you can't find a cheap way to this, uh, drugs and alcohol. Uh, they promise it. Uh, they give you a foretaste of it, but they're false. They're phony. And it's not going to last. But it is going to have a, a lasting impression on, on one. And that's the thing that we never forget. We want to get back to that state. Uh, he, 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 he said... Uh, uh, it was a discovery, a premonition of beauty and meaning, which I had spoiled only by my stupidity. For on the way home from the distillery, uh, I fell over drunk on the street. <laughs> Didn't we all? All right. But there's that craving. I want, that's the part I want you to get, that there's a craving inside of us for wholeness. It's not for holiness. It's for wholeness. And on a, on, a, on a low level, what, what, what Jung is saying is uh, this is our spiritual thirst for God, for union. But he, says, he goes on to say, how could one formulate such an insight in a language that isn't misunderstood in our days? The only right and legitimate way to such an experience is that it happens to you in reality. And it can only happen to you when you walk on a path which leads you to a higher understanding. All right. This this spiritual experience is is open to I believe to all men and women, uh, and it's the thing that when we come into recovery, uh, hopefully someone is pointing us in the direction that leads to this. And, and Jung says there there are several directions, and he lists them. He said you might be led to that goal by an act of grace, an act of grace. It can happen to you, boom, out of the sky. You wake up one morning and boom, something has happened. You're different, you're changed. Uh, I, I had a guy who was a patient of mine in treatment uh, who left, left the treatment center, went out and got, got, um, got high, got really banged up, woke up in an Exxon bathroom station and uh, and looked in the mirror, looked in the mirror in that bathroom, and he didn't know the guy who was in there. I mean, number number one met number two, and it scared the hell out of him. And he he brought himself back to treatment, and he was changed, an act of grace, or through a personal and honest contact with friends. You can come into the fellowship, and uh, you meet others who are on the spiritual journey. And through that contact with them, it's, a, it's the educational variety of religious experience that the book talks about, uh, that it's sometimes slow, sometimes fast. It doesn't matter. Uh, it can be fast and you can go out and blow it, or it can be slow and you can go out and blow it. The important thing is that you continue it. But an honest contact with friends, with others who are on that spiritual journey, or through a higher education of the mind, beyond the kind of confines of mere rationalism. Um, 
And, and, and Jung points out, I see from your letter that Roland has chosen the second way. He got involved with a group. He got involved with the the Oxford group, and through that through that union, through that joining rather uh, with those people, uh, he had found his way. And under the circumstances, uh, Jung says that was obviously the best one. He goes on. I am strongly convinced that the evil principle prevailing in this world leads the unrecognized spiritual need, that longing that people have, uh, that, 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 that the world can really corrupt it. If it is not counteracted either by real religious insight or by the protective wall of human community. And, and ideally, it's both. It's, it's not just that I stay in 12-step recovery and get dependent uh, in, a, in a negative way, uh, in an addictive way, uh, but that I start there and, and that through that process, I go on my own individual journey. And it's in that individual journey that I... Uh, I, 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 I become an integrated self, a whole self, a complete uh, self. Jung calls that the individuation process, and, and we'll get into that later on in the, in the series. But that's the journey, you see. Um, if, if, you're, you know, if you're in recovery for 10, 15, 20 years, and I'm so dependent on my meetings, Something hasn't happened. You know, I ought to be uh, still going to meetings, but, I, but after a certain period of time, hopefully it's not with that sense of desperation. I will have, through my own spiritual journey, found what I needed. My first sponsor in recovery, Floyd, uh, he said, you know, if AA goes away, I'm not going to get drunk. Well, that's freedom. See, he's not dependent on the meetings. He was in the beginning, aren't we all? All right? But at some point, our, our dependency shifts towards God. And that's the one place that, that is never, ever going to let us down. An ordinary man, not protected by an action from above and isolated in society, cannot resist the power of evil which is very aptly called the devil. But the use of such words arouses so many mistakes that one can only keep aloof from them as much as possible. There's a real evil that's present in addiction that robs us of life. It's a wonderful book called The War of the Gods in Addiction. And it's about this correspondence between uh, Wilson and Jung, uh, written by uh, a Jungian therapist, and I strongly encourage you to re read that book. He goes on, these are the reasons why I could not give a full and sufficient explanation to Roland, but I'm risking it with you because I conclude from your very decent and honest letter that you have acquired a point of view above the misleading platitudes one usually hears about alcoholism. And then here comes the real gem, all right? He says, uh, you see, alcohol in Latin is spiritus. And you use the same word for the highest religious experience as well as for the most depraving poison. The helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. Spirit against spirit. The spirit of God against the spirits of addiction. There is the useful formula. Uh, and that's, I mean, if you wanted, if you wanted to sum up uh, what really 12-step recovery is about, I mean, keep in mind the 12th step. I mean, that's the goal, having had initially a spiritual experience as the result of these steps. That, 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 that the, the spirit world opened up to me 
in, in a way that it had not before. And that is, the, that is the purpose of the steps. The purpose is to really remove the blockages that keep me from an experience of God. Uh, steps, you know, six through nine are all about removing uh, those blockages. Actually, you know, even before that, four, four, through, four through nine. Yeah, four through nine. I mean, that, that, that's all about removing the blockages. One through three, I set out on the path. Um, say, I'm, I'm going the route. I'm not turning back this time. Four through nine, I do that inner journey where I discover myself. I discover those two people. And, and, and uh, I want to integrate them into one. That's the longing uh, that, that addicts have. Uh, for wholeness, for wholeness. So that's the journey, is, is to become whole, not, not to become holy, not to become pious. Um, I, I kind of share that with Jung. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm embarrassed by some of the religious language. You know, I am a priest, but uh, occasionally I'll drop the F-bomb with somebody just to kind of shock them. You know, hey, this is not about becoming holy it's about becoming fully yourself. That's what the journey is about. And I love that the quote from the psalm, uh, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. We're built for union with God. We're built to, to, uh, to, to be in connection with God, with other people, and with myself. And the fact is we're not. And the more we are not, the more open we are to addiction. All right, I hope that, hope that makes some sense to you. So in the, in, in the series that we're going to go through, I want to take some of the Jungian concepts like persona, the mask that we put on, uh, the phony person that we become uh, on our journey, and the dark side, the shadow. I want to start looking into, into some of those aspects. I think that's understanding those, facing those, uh, integrating those things uh, is, is, is what, what Jung wanted Roland to do and uh, I think it's what he wants us to do. I think it's what God wants us to do. So uh, I'm kind of looking forward to, to digging into this. It's um, a little bit beyond uh, your traditional uh, AA history work, uh, but I think it's really important. So hope you'll, uh, hope you'll stay with the series and keep coming back. And if it's helpful, drop me a line and uh, make sure to pass it on to other people who, who might benefit from it. So thank you so much for listening. God bless and uh, keep coming back, man and woman. <laughs> Love you.